This reader interview is sponsored by the patrons of the Rereading Wolf podcast. Okay, uh, welcome, Keith Adams. Well, are you ready to play the game? I am. All right. First encounter with a wolf story. First encounter with a wolf story was actually a book of the new sun, which I was like 15 or 16 at a used bookstore in my hometown. And I went in and I was like really into sci-fi and fantasy. And I saw the cover of the uh, combined edition of Shadow and Claw. And I thought the cover looked cool. And then I was kind of a pretentious literary teen. And I saw like the praise from like Ursula Le Guin and people like that. And I was like, oh, this, this seems right up my alley. So I bought it. I read it. I'm not sure I understood it. And that's sort of where everything started. <laughs> well, what was your immediate reaction to it? Mostly confusion. I think my first time through Book of the New Sun, I, I, you know, it was obviously a Catholic story and I got that. And I got that there were mysteries that I wasn't quite understanding. Uh, the only one I was pretty confident about was the world would be flooded and uh, Dorcas was Severian's grandma. Really? You caught, you picked up that the world would be flooded? Yeah, just because it seemed to resonate because I, I couldn't figure out why else all the stuff about the, pl the play mm -hmm. of Talos was in it. And it just seemed to be very Old Testament. And so like, well, it's Old Testament. It's Adam and Eve. You know, they're talking about bringing about a new son. There's obviously some issues there. So like a flood seemed to be like the natural thing that would happen there. Oh, okay. I think that was really kind of a surprise. I remember uh, Michael Andre uh, Driussi had mentioned that, you know, yeah, there's a lot of information there. You could pick up on that, but it's really not necessarily clear from the from the uh, four volumes what would actually happen. So that's pretty impressive. Right. Well, I mean, I think that's that might have been the only time I picked up on something non-obvious in a story. <laughs> and I think that might have just been because I was being, I was operating at a very basic level of knowledge. It's like, well, well, how would you destroy the world? Well, this this seems sort of Adam and Eve Old Testament flood. Well done, well done. Favorite novel or short story, either or both. Uh, so, favorite novel is actually the the second Latro book. Actually, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, Soldier of Arite. Right. Yeah, I, I think of them as one because I bought them in the collected edition, and just I've always read them straight through, never separately. So they're sort of one work in my mind. But I, de I definitely prefer the uh, second half. Yeah, which, now, uh, just curious, why do you prefer the second half to the first half? What is it? What is the portion that you liked about it? I, I think it's just, it's more or less a mechanical plot thing that you're, mm. he, because he's a little bit more advanced and sort of with it in terms of his progression, there's less sort of like going over the very basics of the sort of, you know, every, every chapter is a new sort of thought exercise or at least or maybe i'm just more used to it at that point and i also find the uh the sort of discontinuity about two-thirds of the way through when he's you know stopped uh, writing because of his depression and then picked it back up i i found that just very emotionally effective right yeah yeah i have, I have to agree about that i do i do like the part of the first novel where the uh the guy is changing into a woman i just really really like that now I think, but is it the first one or the second one that has the werewolf people in? I can't remember. They go to the graveyard. I believe that's they go to the graveyard in the first one because it's connected to the. Uh, yeah, see there. Yeah, the yeah. I think it must be the first one I, that I. <laughs> then all the see all my favorite scenes are in the first one. But I okay. Well, that, so that's really interesting, actually. Part of part of the other reason why I find it so interesting is I he does a very good job there, and I think better than in, in any of his other works of sort of presenting a sort of historical old a sort of classical way of thinking which is both alien and not to a modern audience i think that's really you know he does that very well across many different novels but i think it, he's probably at his best doing that in the way Petro novels yeah it, it, well in the second novel i just remembered that's when he goes back home to his family farm and i i did like that too uh favorite wolf word it's not I'm not sure if this counts as a wolf word, but it's probably sanguinary just because I never hear it in any other context. I like that. And it's it's both pretty and evocative, but it also has like a sort of dark underlying meaning. I remember 
sort of this off topic, but when I first heard about the Sangre de Cristo mountains and then found out what they were, I was like, Oh wow, that that's not at all what I would have thought that beautiful sounding name was. <laughs> yeah. That does make it a wolf word. Pretty evocative and dark. So I just always found it just very sort of interesting. A personal non consensus theory about a wolf story or just your favorite one. So I have a question. What is the consensus on whether or not blue and or green are Earth? There is no consensus on that. Yeah. Mark Aramini would be very upset about that. But yeah, there's, I don't think there's total consensus. Yeah. And there is serious, actually, there is a serious pushback by some very established names. Michael Andre Drisi never believed that that was plausible or that there's any time travel in the story. Does all the things that are at the core of Mark's theories. Yeah, all of the, in fact, I think, don't think any of the old guard, Alice K. Turner never believed it. So Roy C. Lackey never believed it. it. It was actually a very long road to uh, Mark getting any acceptance of his theories at all. So I would not consider that to be consensus. So that counts as a non-consensus theory. Oh, hmm. well, because I was definitely going to take the opposite, I guess, which sounds like <laughs> the consensus position, which is, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I've tried it. I've, I've read Mark's series. I really like them. And the thing is, I just could never get over the sort of basic plausibility hurdle of the multiple whims thing. Like none of these sort of mechanisms for explaining, you know, why that happened or how that works or how it comports with normal evolutionary biology or how things work. Like it just doesn't add up. And it's really frustrating to me because I really like it if blue and green, blue and or green were Earth, because it just makes the story a lot more thematically resonant. I just can't get over that multi-limb hurt. Let's try for another one then. Do you have any others that you uh, find is out there, but that you like the sound of it or that you, one of your own that you think no one else is going to read this? Um, so this is actually one you've more or less convinced me of. And it's just, in re like I've, I've started rereading New Sun. Yay! <laughs> I've started rereading New Sun. And I don't, there's, A, there's definitely something up with Agia. B, it, it almost certainly connects with the Hyro duels and something. It just, <laughs> none of her actions just make sense from a very superficial level. And I first read them, and when I reread them and reread them, I just always was like, I, I sort of took it on face value, and I just can't do that anymore. It's like, no, there's, there's way too much just outright weirdness with her. So, you know, <laughs> as, as far as I, like, I'm not sure I'm 100% bought into the first Severian theory, but, uh, yeah, it, it's it seems a lot more compelling to me as an explanation for what's going on with Agia than anything else I've heard. It gives the story a little bit more elbow room. Well, so here, yeah, so I'm actually not super into mysteries. Like I, I can sort of take them at face value. I think, you know, I, I my my perspective is Wolf sort of. I think you know maybe he had something in mind specifically, but I think he pretty clearly constructed all his stories to be deliberately ambiguous polysemous however you want to call it and they're and susceptible to multiple readings i think that was a deliberate choice even if he had something specific in mind so you know as long as i can find something semi-plausible i'm pretty much okay just sort of taking a book or a story at face value and you know it's just sort of like accepting the language, getting into the prose, getting into the characters, getting into the motions. That kind of breaks down a little bit in some of his later works, like The Land Across, just because I, because there's, there's, there's nothing there to hold on to. It doesn't work on an emotional level, and the prose is strong, but because it doesn't work on an emotional level, I'm just le left going, I have no idea what happened at all, or why I'm supposed to care. And so I do think... The Land Across, specifically, I find by far his most frustrating story. For whatever reason, yeah. I think... That, 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 you want to talk about consensus, that is a consensus right there. <laughs> yeah, that seems to be a new kind of consensus that's coming out about that, too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. whereas, for instance, like uh, the bo A Borrowed Man and Interlibrary Loan, you know, I was able to perfectly enjoy those, even though I'm still... 
I don't really know what's going on with the multiple world stuff just because, mm-hmm. you know, it's an interesting sort of noirish detective story on its face. Even if you don't understand what's going on, that's a classic tradition in noir. And, you know, you can look at something like the big sleep where there's the famous anecdote where they ask the screenwriter who killed this guy. And he's like, I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you don't necessarily have to. <laughs> so like for inter- and then like interlibrary loan i think has some of the, like his just best straight writing right oh yes yeah best writing in years right but yeah but like home fires land across i'm just like i just sort of have to throw my hands up at a certain point and go what's the point mm-hmm. yeah i'm i'm with you so those are the most frustrating just because <laughs> they don't have the other stuff that i'm really interested in so i'm just left with the plot and when i'm just left with the plot i get very frustrated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I've never read Land Across. I guess I need to take up the challenge like everyone else has and take my wounds. <laughs> I feel left out. Everyone else has come back with all these bruises and said, man, Land Across, Land Across. And who knows? I could come out with some really, come back with some really bonkers theory out of that thing. And- yeah. My, my best guess, I think after reading it was like Soviet vampires, question mark. <laughs> And that's about as far as I got. <laughs> well, that does sound like a good pitch. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Keith. Yeah, we appreciate it. Oh, great. It was a pleasure. Do I need to save the recording on my end or do anything like that? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Very well done. You don't have to save the recording, but don't go away until I stop it because that is my big failing here. So I'm going to stop it. This was, again, entirely sponsored by the patrons of the Rereading Wolf podcast. You can go to patreon.com slash rereadingwolf to play a part in bringing other amazing things like this into the world. And if you want to take on the five questions with us, reach out to us by email or one of the other methods listed in the show notes of this episode.